Good afternoon and welcome to the American Floral Endowment Grow Pro webinar series. I'm your moderator, Melissa Muñoz. I'm a member of AFE's Young Professionals Council and I'm an NC State University postdoctoral research scholar at the Mountain Horticultural Crops Research and Extension Center. I have a master's and a PhD in plant and environmental sciences from Clemson University, both working with botrytis blight management in cut roses. Today's session is on creating culture of sanitation. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of the AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry member. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous sponsor of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by Syngenta. Syngenta is a leading science-based ag tech company that helps millions of farmers around the world to grow safe and nutritious food while taking care of the planet. If you would like to learn more about our sponsor, or if you are a supplier interested in becoming a sponsor for a specific topic, you can find that information and more about the webinar series on the AFE's website at endowment.org slash growpro, which will be put in the chat. Today's session will be presented by Dr. Rosa Raudales. After the presentation, we will open up the discussion for Q&I. Uh, so please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&I feature or the chat at any time. We will answer as many questions as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared through the AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed caption and other languages. To get us started, I would like to share a bit about today's expert speaker. Dr. Rosa Raudales is an associate professor of horticulture and greenhouse extension specialist at the University of Connecticut. She has a PhD degree in horticultural sciences, a master's in plant pathology, and a bachelor degree in agricultural sciences and production systems. Rosa's program focuses on conducting outreach and applied research in greenhouse related problems with an emphasis on biological water quality. She's a native Honduran and does training for the Hispanic workforce in greenhouses and nurseries. Dr. Raudales, welcome, and thank you for presenting today on creating a culture of sanitation. Thank you, Melissa. So we're gonna get started. Um, so like Melissa said, I'm gonna talk about creating a culture of sanitation. And every time I start a presentation, I like to set the expectations of what you're gonna be learning by the end of the talk. This presentation is not going to talk about specific protocols that you need to clean surfaces. That's a very important subject, but that's not the subject that we're going to cover today. Today, we're really talking about creating a culture and how we can all, all the people who are involved in the company or in any way related to the company can be part of the sanitation process because keeping a clean greenhouse is essential for us to make sure that we grow healthy crops, but also it's very important in terms of worker safety. So to get started, we're gonna make sure we're all in the same page relating to what the definition of sanitation is. Sanitation is a plus process of cleaning an area. And by area, you're good, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, we're talking about surfaces all over the greenhouse, everywhere from the structure to the area where the plants are growing to the plants themselves. So the area is everything inside that production zone. And the main goal for this is one is to protect plant health, but the other one and equally important is regarding staff safety. And I think COVID was a good example for us to remember that sanitation and having a clean space a space that's aired and free of contaminants is important for staff safety as well. So make sure that when you're talking and thinking about sanitation in your operation, you keep that in mind that it has to be related to health center, but it's keeping in mind both the plant and the staff safety. 
So like I said, today we're not going to talk about protocols on what's the best sanitizer to clean a specific surface. We're going to talk about the culture of sanitation. And I'll give you just one pause here and let you think a little bit about what is it that comes to mind when we think about the word culture, right? Think about it. Uh, if you think about social culture, what is it that you think about it and what are the components that are essential for it to be part of becoming a culture, right? So this is a term that encompasses one, having knowledge. So when you're thinking about how you're gonna train your staff, you gotta generate some knowledge. You gotta think about social behaviors and social behaviors, it's just about the way we move around in our social environment. And that's something that we do in the greenhouses. Um, we always think about it in terms of technical th aspects, but reality is that every time humans are doing different activities, that's a social behavior. And then what are the norms that drive what we do? So what are the rules that would drive us and what are the things that we care about, right? So when all those things are put together, we adopt them and then later pass them to whoever's coming next to this place, it's because it's embedded in our culture, right? It's not something that you, we even think about it too much anymore. It's just part of who we are. And just a, a little in, um, definition there from the root of the word, culture comes from the word cultivate to tend. So it has kind of a horticultural root. So very interesting to make sure that we remember, okay, we're trying to cultivate the people that we're working with to make sure that we get the results that we want. So why do we think about culture, right? Again, we have something called standard operating procedures and that the example of a standard operating procedure would be, okay, I wanna clean this surface and to clean this surface, I'm gonna first remove the debris, then I'm gonna apply the sanitizer, I'm gonna leave a given contact time, and then I'm gonna brush it or, all of those steps that you take to do something is your standard operating procedure. And the goal of a standard operating procedure is you follow the, the step by step and at the end you get a result. But the reason we're talking about culture today and not necessarily about standard operating procedures is because we're dealing with people, right? And everyone that we're working with, uh, if we were robots, we would have a protocol of what needs to be done. But we're actually dealing with people. And I'll, and even though every day there is fewer and fewer people touching our plants, there's still a massive amount of people who are touching the plants in our industry. So it's very important that when we think about how we're training people, we keep in consideration that people have different ways of learning and have different ways of adapting and responding to how we train them. So very important to understand that even if you don't, if you have not outlined what the culture of your company should be, there is a culture that, that drives itself and that it, it, um, it develops, even if you're not proactively developing. So what I want to encourage you today to think about it is when we think about sanitation, are we letting the culture be defined and developed all by itself, by things we do without thinking? Or is it something that we can proactively guide and build for us to have a clean space where we can grow healthy plants and have safe, safe staff? So in this presentation, we're going to discuss, first we're gonna give you like broad guidelines on how to train staff in sanitation. As Melissa mentioned, uh, I also had a degree in communication and education. And part of it is because I'm always fascinated with the extension portion and how people learn and what are the things that trigger people to acquire uh, a new habit and incorporate it in the long term. So that's where we're gonna touch a little bit on that. And then we're gonna talk broadly about what are some of the sanitation practices that should be part of the culture, okay? Um, when we think about how we explain to people, to our staff, what is it that we wanna do? We start by explaining what is sanitation? I already gave you a definition and you can, you can define it based on the, the parameters that fit best within your operation. But I think a very easy way to think about sanitation without getting too fancy about uh, the end goals at the beginning is to keep it simple and say, when we think about sanitation, we wanna start as clean as possible. We wanna stay as clean as possible. And it's important to say as possible because we gotta keep it real. Uh, we, we know that we can't be there in the peak season. It's very hard to stay on top of certain things, but we wanna do our best. 
And then we want to finish clean. And you can think of that not just at the space, but you got to think about the plant and you're going to think about your staff as well, right? The other aspect that's very, very important when we think about how people learn is to explain the why. And why is one of the most important training concepts that you want to take with you today? Because it is well known that when you explain to people the importance of why something is, it works or why are we doing an activity, they're more likely to remember that it needs to be done and they're more likely to understand the importance and carry on with the activity. For example, if you tell your staff that everyone has to pick up the host from the floor, doesn't matter what your job is, but if you don't tell them why, they're gonna be like, okay, we pick up the hose. Um, it's not worth my time unless I understand. Well, if you leave the nozzle touching the floor, you could get disease, pick up, and then when you water the plants, you spread disease, or you can talk about how it can be a trip hazard. So you're explaining briefly, but directly, why is it that it's so important to keep the plants set clean? Why is it that we do certain activities, right? In general, the big why that we have for sanitation, again, is to have a safer, it's because a clean work area is always safer than a dirty one. And that safer goes both for plants and for the, the humans that are working in that space. So when we think about sanitation as a cultural strategy, when we're trying to expand a little bit more in detail as to why we want to do a sanitation strategy, we start to think about, we want to reduce the risk of pest and disease on greenhouse crops. We want to minimize the need to use pesticides. Uh, I'm sure if you follow any of the, um, the GrowPro seminars, a lot of the ones that the American Floral Endowment does, they talk a lot about pesticide resistance, in particular, for example, about trips and, and pest management. But the other thing is reduce the staff exposure to pesticides, right? So if you prevent those, uh, issues from happening, you are minimizing those risks. Um, you can protect your staff from biological or physical hazards. We're going to give you some examples in a little bit. And ultimately, we're in the business of growing high quality crops. So that's why we want to keep clean, healthy, and beautiful plants to, that we can sell. One of the things that I want to emphasize too is that there is a big difference between talking about a culture and specific roles that people play in a, in a business. When I'm talking about culture, it doesn't mean that because it's everyone's job, it's also no one's job to do specific things. There are some things that we all do, and we're going to talk about those, but there are also activities that a specific person will do. So for example, Scouting is something that ideally you have the same person doing the scouting because they have a trained eye, they can keep a, an eye on the trends, and they have a role that they can that one or two people are doing the scouting, and they have a systematic way in which they do that. The culture tends to not be a systematic because it's just, again, it's something that we do always and we all do, but it doesn't mean that we're leaving out that systematic type of scouting or that systematic type of maintaining equipment to make sure that things are getting done properly. So the two have to live together. They can't live one without the other. And that's also a very, very important uh, thing to take away from today's presentation. So the other aspect as well to think about is how we explain what needs sanitizing. Because we started very broad talking about okay, we want to clean and we want to start clean, finish clean. Uh, what, what, does, what is it that we need to clean? Um, you can start with all the surfaces that you see around. You can start with thinking about the, of course, the plants, again, the walls, the surface of the media. It's going to be a little bit something that you're going to tailor to specifically to your operation. And one of the things that we do in my lab and that we started doing a few years ago is that we're starting to map greenhouses. This is something that we're doing mostly with hydroponic systems um, where we're going and we're trying to identify, okay, when we're at a sewing station, we have a specific material. Some materials, for example, lend themselves to have more pathogens or retain more pathogens than others. What are the risks that I have in this space? So just as a specific example, if you have um, stainless steel table in your sewing area, that's something that's very clean, easy to clean. So you know that there's 
that you need to clean, but that the risks are few in there. Let's say you have a table that's made of wood. Some, some greenhouses still have some wooden tables, specifically in the production area. So we know that there's a lot of evidence that pathogens can survive way better on wood and organic type materials. So that's an area where you know you're gonna have to sanitize in the different areas. So all I'm trying to say here is that when you think about your own greenhouse, you wanna go around the greenhouse and think, this is an area where I need to put a little bit more attention and where we all need to put more attention. This is an area doesn't mean that I don't have to put attention, but it, you can also identify it as an area where maintaining it clean is relatively easy, right? So make sure that you understand when you're thinking about training your staff on where to sanitize that they understand that risks might be different by area. And again, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this as well. The other thing that is very important is that when we're thinking about sanitation, the targets that we have in mind tend to be very specific. Um, one is organic debris, and that can be in the form of plants. It can be detached leaves. It can be organic media. Um, that's kind of the main thing of, of the type of organic debris that you're going to find in your uh, greenhouses. Pathogens. Again, with the pandemic, we were all trained to think about human pathogens. In our industry, we never thought too much about human pathogens. In, if you're growing any edibles, you think about uh, foodborne pathogens all the time. And in our industry, we're always very conscious about plant pathogens. Pest, any type of insects and mites that can be introduced into the space. We're also thinking about algae, and I'll show you some examples of that as well. And then weeds is the other sanitation target that we are going to talk about. And I guess the other one that I should have put there as a target is just uh, overall having a clean space, but I'll show you some of that as well. So again, now we're gonna get into a transition where we're going to talk about what are the specific activities that everyone in the greenhouse, it doesn't matter if you are the owner, if you're in sales, if you're in production, everyone in the greenhouse needs to uh, follow. The first one is that you want to come in with clean clothes and shoes. And I say that's a no negotiable. And one of the things that's important here is that some operations have a combination of outdoor and indoor production. Those are places where you need to be the most careful because you don't want to go to the field and then come to your propagation house. And that's an extreme example that I know you wouldn't do. But you always want to start working on the cleanest space possible and then go to what would be, quote unquote, the dirtiest space. So make sure everyone comes in clean. That's the, the first thing to do. And again, it doesn't matter if you're the owner. It doesn't matter if you're in sales and you went to show a client outdoors first and then you come into the greenhouse. That's something that shouldn't be... Um, part of what they do, they should, if you're there in sales, they should also know that when you bring your client, you bring them to the clean space as well, okay? Um, there are some greenhouses that do a very good space in having some uh, cleaning space that are that clean the soles and the shafts of your boots and your shoes. Ideally, you'll have those. One of the things that my advisor did when I was in Florida is that he measured how much uh, bacteria was in all these cleaning spaces. So make sure you maintain your equipment because if you have spaces where you clean your shoes, but those brushes are not clean, then you're just spreading the problem, right? But when it comes back to the culture, just make sure that it's part of what we all do, that we all come in with clean clothes and shoes, that we never go from the dirtiest space to the cleanest space, that we do it always cleanest to dirtiest when we start working. The other thing is we wanna think about washing our hands frequently. It's very important to emphasize when we're training our staff that soap and abundant water is your best tool here. Um, first of all, when you have soap, you the soap is able to disintegrate a lot of that bacteria that's gonna be in your hand. The other factor that's very important about soap and water is that when you think about how you're washing your hands, one of the reasons washing your hands is better than sanitizing is because of the amount of contact you have when you're washing your hands and the amount of um, solution, the water with the soap that's going through the different uh, spaces in your hands. So 
the better the contact area, the more clean it's going to be. When you think about using sanitizers, sanitizers are your second best option. It's not that they don't work, but they're not as good as washing your hands with uh, soap and water. So you can use sanitizer, but again, think about the contact time and make sure that everyone is aware that just putting a little drip and like tapping it in your hands is not how we do it. Again, because we have a culture where we do it and when we do it, we do it well, right? Um, Okay. The next thing is to start with clean plant material. And this is one that I remember I gave a presentation and someone uh, was a little bit confused about how this is part of the culture. And the reason this is part of the culture is because everyone who sees an incoming plant, whether you touch it or not, is responsible for looking at them. Um, but also, again, I'm going to involve a lot of the people who are in purchasing. Uh, if you're purchasing plant material and, and that is part of your job, you want to make sure that you don't reduce costs at the expense of quality. That's one thing. So that's how people are involved in thinking about how do we start with the cleanest material possible, the highest quality of product possible. If you're the person who receives the shipment, you should keep an eye and make sure that you are taking a... a a good eye that things look properly, even if your job is not to open the box, make sure that everything, at least in the seal package, looks well. Um, and then if you're the person who is in charge of transplanting or sticking or whatever the material you're working with is, uh, you got to make sure that you're just keep an eye on what you're putting in, in a pot. It's always easier and less expensive to get rid of a plant at this stage than it is to do it later in the production system. And I know it's easier to say it right now, but when you're in peak season, you don't want to miss a week. But getting the wrong crop in, it can be very costly. Um, and one of the things that I'll take the, the chance to say here, and I'm going to say this a few times, is that it's very important to make sure that while we're thinking about sanitation, because we're talking again about a culture of sanitation, that we're also having a culture where people have the liberty to express and indicate when something's wrong. One of the barriers that I've seen in terms of making sure that everyone is on the same page is the lack of communication. Like Melissa mentioned, one of the things I do is that I do a lot of training for the Hispanic workforce. And I've had conversations with a lot of the staff there and they sometimes tell me things and I've asked them, so have you told this to your supervisor? And they said, I've kind of said it, but they don't, or they don't listen to me or they don't believe me. So I think when we're thinking about creating a culture, it's also very important that we understand that we also have to create a space where people can be, are able to say things. So I'm going to talk a little bit as, as um, later about examples on rogging infected plants but let's talk about right now about starting with clean material if i'm the one who's doing um who receives a shipment of cuttings and when i saw them i there were symptoms but i ignore the symptoms for whatever reason and i did all my sticking i did my good numbers but the quality of the cuttings was terrible and i didn't say anything i think it's an opportunity to teach and to learn and say hey rosa did you notice these things in the cuttings? If we see cuttings like this, you got to make sure that you tell us and that you don't stick those, right? But if I am not given the opportunity or the put in the position where I can at least say, I don't think this should be put into the tray, then I'm just going to do it, right? So it, in order to create a positive culture where those things happen and we're all proactive and we're all involved, we need to give that space as well. And we need to make sure that we have a communication that goes in every single direction. Um, so the next thing here is to place plants in a clean space. And here we're talking about maintaining clean floors. So this is an example that I really love because you can see that it's very unusual to have those propagation trays on the floor, but you can see this is actually a very good grower and they grow their things, their, their propagation trays on the floor, and they do it by keeping their gravels really clean. So it's, you don't have to have the top of the line of in terms of equipment, but you do have to have 
a good practice where things are kept clean. The other thing, this is one, I would say one of the most important ones where when we think about how we train the people who works in our business and it's to monitor for signs and symptoms. As a general rule, you always want to place new material in what you can designate as a quarantine area. It doesn't mean that it's infected, but it's always a good practice if you can and if you have the space to keep things separate and make sure that you keep an eye if you can, and then you integrate them with the rest of the production area. Not always easy because, again, I know that space is always an issue. But this is one where I think everyone should have some basic training on basic disease and pest ID. You don't need to know how to manage, but everyone should know what normal looks like. And when I do a lot of the training for the Hispanic workforce, we put a lot of emphasis on trying to make sure that everyone knows what normal is and everyone has a good sense of what are the things that it's like, mm, this doesn't look like it's all right. It doesn't matter that you don't need to necessarily be uh, an expert in identifying what it is, but you just need to know that something is not the way it should look or that it, if it looks, if all you can do is describe it as it just looks weird and different than they usually look like, that is a good sign where on where to start in identifying problems. But it's very important that people know that they are, um, that they can tell the difference between what's normal and what's not. And again, going back to why this is something that is part of the culture. Again, if you're the salesperson that you're walking around with your clients to show what's available and you're showing uh, infected plants, then you probably would avoid those plants, right? If you knew that ahead of time. Or if that's the opportunity when you look at the plants and you can catch a problem early, then as a salesperson, you should always also be involved in that process, right? And then everyone else who touches the plants through their work of course, they should all be very well trained in terms of identifying what are the potential causes of problems and what is not normal and what's normal. Uh, the other thing is there also needs, it goes back to what I said earlier, that people have to have some, first of all, training on identifying what's not normal, but also they should be able to have um, the trust if you trust them. And, and you might lose a lot of plants in, finding that good balance. But if you find something that you've been trained about and you know, oh gosh, I do have bacterial spot. So if I'm working with a lot of plants and you are asking me to remember in which tray it was, uh, you either have to give me a system like a flag so I can flag it for the supervisor to come and see it, or you gotta give the staff <clears throat> the opportunity and the trust to say, okay, if you see this, you just pull it out and throw it away, okay? Uh, but you got to make sure that you're comfortable with that as a supervisor, as a head grower. Of course, if you reach a point where they're throwing out too much in a lot of what's being thrown out, it's healthy material. You don't want to go to that place. But you would be um, in a good position if all your staff have a good eye in identifying disease plants early on in their uh, infection process. So that's something, again, it's something that takes time. It's something that it takes a lot of training in terms of identifying and training your staff, but it also takes for the supervisor to give the staff the room to do, either pull it out or give them a system. If you don't wanna trust that, you should give them a system where they can flag them easily without too much of a burden. But I think if you want, if you're really interested in building that culture, we are trying to go more in the direction where everyone's trusted that they can do the job well. And it takes training, but it's where the ideal situation would look like. Um, and I'm gonna say, and, and I wanna say a story about this. Just last week, I went to a, a greenhouse grower here in Connecticut, and they're a very small operation, but they're growing hydroponic lettuce. And the example there, they, there's a head grower and they have two staff members. And one of the staff members, she's not trained in plants at all, or she wasn't, but she's been working with them for six months. And one of the things I mentioned was, uh, you should be pulling out plants when you see them infected, especially if it's root rot, because you know, root rot spreads like a beauty in hydroponic systems. And the staff member said, yes, as soon as I joined, that's something I suggested to, to the head grower. And now that's what we do. So we've been pulling out those plants. She's been given the trust 
So it's been refining over time, which ones are really the ones that look like they might be problematic. I'm sure she pulls out some that are not symptomatic sometimes, maybe, but the, the point is that she might be able to save a crop and we don't know it because when you are um, implementing risk aversion techniques, you don't know what you save yourself from. So it's one of those things that sometimes you want to go more on the safe side and lose a couple of plants, but not lose your whole crop or your whole section. Um, the other thing here is, I mentioned this before, you want to work with susceptible crops first, always think about young to old, and then cleanest to dirtiest, never do it the other way around. We all do that. Going back to the example of if you're the salesperson, you should also walk around the greenhouse in that same order. The other is clean equipment between uses. And this is one that we, it's kind of a standard operating procedure, but it's also one that we think about um, going back to the example of cleaning your shoes. If you're coming into an area and the solution is really dirty, maybe it's not your job to do it, but maybe you are the one who can do it and make sure that you are part of the, the team who replaces that solution because something like the solution at the entrance of the greenhouse is one that goes sometimes unnoticed. Um, and then remain clean, no weeds or debris. One of the things that's very important is to have a space in the greenhouse where people can uh, throw away their weeds. Ideally, you want to have something that's sealed in case there's any pest on it. But again, this is one where it should be part of everyone's role. If you're walking in the greenhouse and you see one weed, it takes no effort to pull out the weed put it in your pocket or wherever, but um, make sure that it's pulled out. Why would you let, why would you not do that, right? It's kind of where we try to go. And then the, um, I, I'm gonna sound very repetitive here, but this is also a good example to talk about these carding plants that have uh, plant diseases or pests, anything that's non-marketable. Unhealthy plants are more vulnerable to having diseases and attract insects. So they represent more a risk than an opportunity. And I know that in time when um, when space is money, you don't wanna put the space uh, in, in your space crops that you're likely not to be sold because the quality is not gonna be there. So very important to make sure that we, again, that, we, they, that we're all proactive about it, but that we also give our staff the training and the trust to do it. And then going back, no debris, no weeds. Ideally, you want to have a greenhouse that looks this clean. Um, that's a gold standard. And we also see one of the things that you always will see in some of the cards, and you can, can tell how much people are overworked sometimes, is how clean their cards are. And again, no judgment here, but I, because I know it's very difficult. But a lot of the botrytis sometimes is going to come from having all those leaves in there. Um, in old leaf seeding, if you see this one here, if you leave it for too long, you get a nice area for botrytis to expand. Avoid excessive water. That's something that we should all uh, stay on top of, not overwatering. Close the hoses when they're doing it. It's very well known that if you have too much water, it's going to splash pathogens. But how do we all as a culture can think about splashing water? Let's say someone water the crop and it's gonna look like this, it's okay. There will be free water sitting on our floors, that's inevitable. But what happens when you're walking around is what becomes part of an important cultural message is that because we know that we can splash pathogens from here to other areas of the plants, we just gotta make sure and how we move around the greenhouse, like try not to like be too aggressive if you're driving your cart on top of it or if you're walking on top of it try to avoid that splashing of um, water into different parts of the crop. Same here, avoiding excessive free water. This is another one where it's a good example on why cleaning walkways. It's very important in terms of staff safety. This is a greenhouse where you can see, and this happens in every greenhouse, the algae accumulates, and that's just inevitable, especially in this is a, a greenhouse in Michigan, I believe, but if you have propagation houses, the algae will just be there. Um, it's almost inevitable. But again, you want to have a cleaner space if possible. And the alternative is you avoid the space. And then the other part here is to space the crop properly. And again, when we think about how is this a cultural item, 
um, that we need to keep in mind. You sometimes see crop um, containers falling down, or you can see that for every reason they were pushed, takes no time sometimes to accommodate them. And I, I think it's um, small things that can accumulate. And one of the things that's really, really important, if you can see what's going on in this picture, I'll give you a second here. You can see that this hose is sitting on the floor here. And not only the whole hose is there, but you can see that the nozzles up here. So you, as, an, as a greenhouse supervisor or owner, you wanna make sure that you make it easy for people to hang the hose. Here, there is that hook to hang the hose. So this should not be here. Um, Whereas ideally you wanna make it a way where it's easier for your staff to move the hoses, but it's easier for them to leave them hanging. So as an owner, you can, you gotta think about the culture of, oh, okay, we all pick up the hoses, but what is it that I can do to make it easier for you to always leave the hose up there? And this is something that when we think about it, probably there is no particular risk to the plants. Uh, the pumps are working well, the filters are working well, but I don't think it's a good idea. You don't know if mice might be hiding there. You don't also know if you you have an issue here with leaking or something, you're not gonna see them because it's all cluttered. So again, in order to catch problems early, you need to be able to see things clearly um, and have good access. And again, one of the, the hardest thing I think and why is it so important that we're all part of, of the sanitation process is to keep it as clean as possible. There are some greenhouses that they simply do it so well, they can grow really tight. And you can see this is a nice example where this greenhouse, their benches are immaculate. I think, I, I, I don't know how they did it, but they have like a, a beautiful clean space full of all those nice flowers. This is a classic New England, um, garden center and you can see very tight in how they're growing but you would not find any anything misplaced in this little greenhouse so again it doesn't matter your size I think uh, if you have a system in place where everyone is involved with keeping the greenhouse clean and you make it easier for your staff to do it everyone can be involved in keeping the greenhouse somewhat clean and then the idea is that in between seasons, you do a deep cleaning. There are some things like, as you see the algae accumulated here, it's gonna be something that's very hard and not realistically, uh, uh, no, wouldn't be a realistic suggestion to say, oh, you gotta get rid of that algae in peak production system. It's not realistic. Uh, but in between seasons, that's when you do a deep cleaning. And this one is one that probably doesn't apply as much when we think about establishing a culture, but it's more about how we can think of how we can set up systems in place to make sure that when we have an empty space, we can take advantage of that and clean properly. And then finally, one of the things with sanitation is that failure is visible eventually. Sooner or later, you're going to see that if you have a lot of algae accumulated on the floors, it, it's really slippery. We have that issue in our propagation house here all the time. So it's one that you either stay on top or you're gonna see things not working. And it might also affect the crop um, sooner or later. And I'm gonna close with um, just a few overall training suggestions. Um, one is to make it easy to remember and act. So signs are very important. Color coding is very important. Um, use whatever you can use in your greenhouse space and what you think works for your space and for the people that work with you. Make it easy for them to remember and act. So if you tell me, if there's a sign that says, Didi, clean your shoes before coming in, right before I come in, I'm more likely to do it than if you don't remind me, right? Um, there's another fact that's really important, and that's one of the things that I've been very interested in working with, with our Connecticut industry. It's about reminding and retraining. We are been doing a lot of like short videos on how to train, because sometimes there is not enough time to train like again and again, but if you just give me a few reminders of something you already trained me about, it's gonna be very useful for me to start the season and think, oh, okay, I do need to do a sanitation this way. And then the, the other thing that is also really important for those who have supervisory roles 
is to train by example. And that is really a golden rule. You cannot ask your team to clean their, ha their hands every time they come to a section, but then they see you coming in and you don't do it. Then they think, oh, it's not important. It's not useful. So why bother? If they're seeing me, I'll do it. If I don't, I wouldn't do it because that's what my supervisor is teaching me, right? So train and lead by example. And then just to summarize, uh, a clean greenhouse is definitely one that will be a more productive greenhouse because you're going to reduce your crop loss. Good culture is about cultivating the people and the environment where everyone is responsible and everyone is re rewarded. I think this is something that's key. Make sure that everyone understands that we're all responsible for growing healthy crops. Make sure that if I unusually, I'm very good at scouting, but that's not my job. Make sure that you reward me. And it's not always about financial reward. It's about making sure that you recognize that I'm doing that job and I'm doing that well. Um, the other thing that's very important, depending on the role you play in your business, is that culture is established by the top of the organization and lived by everyone. It's not going to be the worker who's going to start and say, oh, how about we all make sure that we scout? No, they can't say that unless you create a culture where you say, okay, we all do this. We all keep it clean. We all wash our hands. You as a leader and as an owner, make sure that you establish the systems in place and that you all again train by example. But again, it always, when it comes to building a culture, it's most likely having to come from the people at the top to make sure that it's lived by everyone. And then the last thing and one that, that I think it's, Maybe a little bit subjective for me to say that, but I but I think I've seen it in with the people I work with, especially with the workers, is that there is something about taking pride in a job well done. I think it's very important for all of us to, to think that we're being valued and that what we do, we do it well. So I think that's also an important message that when we're building a culture, we think about how that matters and how that is going to make us um, do a better job and be safer. So with that, I can hand it over to Melissa and I'm going to take off my screen. Thank you very much, Rosa, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, right now, I would like to open up the session for questions. So you can do it through the Q&A option or through the chat. Um, let's give um, some people a little bit of time. Although I have a question over here that I would like to ask you, and I also want to highlight an important point that you made, and it's what normal looks like, uh, because I think that a lot of the times that is not clear for everybody. So I'm I'm like very happy that you mentioned that. Um, also, can you explain on the benefits? of mapping the greenhouse and how to use the information for sanitation? Yes, so one of the things that we've been doing very closely with, with some of the growers here in the state is that we go around their greenhouse and we, you, you have to have some knowledge about understanding areas of high risk and areas of low risk. So I'm gonna put the example of propagation houses. Propagation houses are considered high risk because the plants are succulent, it's very wet environment. So it would be very wet on the floor. It would be very risky for the crop to do it. So you highlight and you map that, okay, this is high risk area. So you can either, call, there are people, for example, that have told me that they color code areas like, okay, you only come in here in the morning and you don't come here after coming in from a red zone. So if you map your greenhouse to identify zones where there are certain activities that you can do, that's one of the ways that you can use it. But the other thing that's really important in that that I've been learning a lot about is how you look at the materials that are that how are the materials that you're working with? There is a scientist called Warren Copes, and he did a lot of research on the survival of pathogens on different types of surfaces. And that also helps you identify areas of risk and also helps you think about, okay, I'm building my greenhouse. There are certain materials that you can be using that will help you minimize your risks of disease. And then when you're thinking about your sanitation processes, again, thinking about risks and how different activities can be taken place. 
So it's kind of a risk assessment type of analysis where you go and it's very similar to a process that's used in, in food production. It's called hazard analysis, the critical control point. So you go around the greenhouse, identify where there's a hazard, and then you develop a control mechanism there. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Carlos Martinez. A great presentation, Rosa, thank you. What do you recommend for disinfecting tools and surfaces? So I, I know a little bit more about surfaces than tools. Um, when it comes to disinfecting surfaces, the first thing when you think about, before you even think about what are the better materials is to think about the fact that you have to do a two-step process. First, you gotta remove all the debris, whether it's like organic matter that's been accumulated or you think about the dust in there. Uh, you clean that very well because you don't want to put a sanitizer in there because the sanitizer will interact with that organic matter or that debris, and then it's less effective, right? So first thing, when you think about any type of surfaces, whether it's a tool or whether it's a hard surface in your greenhouse, you do that first. And then when it comes to sanitizers, um, there, are, there are various different types of sanitizers. I would say the ones that growers really like when it comes to sanitizing the surfaces. Uh, strip it is a, it's an acid cleaner. It works really well. You can use it on cooling pads, glazing, gravel, floors, um, you name it, it works really well. Um, I would say when you, if you have a real hard infection and, and you, you realize that you need to do a deep cleaning, I would use something like a like a stronger oxidizer, something like a chlorine or a high concentration of chlorine dioxide products. Um, I would say when it comes to tools, it's a little bit trickier because it's more about what tool and what crop you're working with. So the, the, the obvious example is if you're working with something with TMV, you, you've heard that milk is a good sanitizer um, and ethanol it works, but not as good. So I think with tools, it's a little bit tricky. I wouldn't say I know the whole good combination there. It's more about what crop you work with and what pathogen you're concerned about. Um, but you can also use any of those activated peroxygen products like xerotol sanitate. One of those is specifically labeled for tools. I can't remember which one, but yeah. uh, Kind of related to that, uh, can you give an example on what's the best way to clean a non-porous uh, surface? Yeah, so so, uh, so just so to emphasize, so we have the pores and the non-porous surfaces. So the non-porous surfaces is similar to what I just mentioned mm -hmm. regarding um, concrete would be a non-porous surface and something like wood would be a more porous surface. Mm -hmm. so, so what I said earlier about using something like strip it would be something that you can use for so, because glazing, gravel, concrete, all of those would include porous surfaces. Um, yeah. And then just to add a little bit extra there, the other type of surfaces that we think of, when you come into a greenhouse, everyone sees different things, right? So if you go um, with Melissa, she probably looks at botrytis everywhere. <laughs> um, so I go into a greenhouse and I look at surfaces. And when you look into a greenhouse, surfaces are all over the place, obviously. But uh, you can think about benches. You have expanded metal. You can look at irrigation lines. There's different materials that you can look at when you think about irrigation lines. That's a different type of surface. Or for example, with PVCs uh, or polyethylene, you can use something like fluorine dioxide or chlorine. Depends what's at the end of the line. If it's there's different rates you can use as well. Um, but again, depends on what's at the end of the line as well. And then with the, the one thing I didn't say when we talk about cleaning surfaces is that one of the reasons you wanna use something like strip it, for example, is that strip it will typically not off gas as opposed to using something like chlorine. Chlorine can off gas and be phytotoxic. Um, so that's why you, you save the stronger oxidizers for situations where you really want to clean the space, but most likely your crop's not there. So in between seasons, you would use something stronger like a, like a peroxide or a chlorine dioxide. Yes. I know you mentioned that 
washing the hands, which is like soap and water, is the best option. Uh, but do you have any products that are like the best hand sanitizers? Or yeah. like non-water and soap? <laughs> so that is a very good question because people go, but sometimes they get distracted by the brands of hand sanitizers. And one of the things that's important to think about is that when we think about the active ingredients of hand sanitizers, they would basically have two. One is alcohol and there's like ethyl alcohol or isopropyl alcohol. Um, and then the other one is benzoyl codium chloride. It's very similar to a hand soap active ingredient. So for example, Purell has both active ingredients. Um, the benefit of the, ben the benzoyl codium chloride is that it's a little bit more stable. Alcohol, the reason you always have sanitizers with the gel, uh, it's because the gel is the carrier that slows down the evaporation of alcohol, right? Uh, but that other product doesn't evaporate as quickly as alcohol. So in that sense, having that other product is slightly better than the alcohol. In terms of efficacy, if they're both fresh, it seems like they're both equally effective. But yeah, the, the good, the, the most important thing with um, hand sanitizers is one is the product has to be fresh. Two, you gotta make sure you have a good amount of contact around your hand because that's kind of a big disadvantage and why it doesn't work as well as washing with hand is, uh, with water and soap. Perfect. And um, how can be how can algae be, can be prevented from building up on walk ways of greenhouses? I know it's a tricky one and very hard, but do you have any like key points on that? Yeah, algae is one of the things that I've been working for a long time. And I, I really don't have a good answer because algae grows wherever, wherever the plants grow, the same conditions are very conducive to plants. Um, and one of the things that with algae is you can use the sanitizers like the stripid or the or hortifloor works well as well, or you can use a stronger oxidizers like chlorine dioxide, oxidate. Um, you can use any of those and they will help. But with chlorine, with algae on the surfaces, it's more about staying on top of like the physical removal of those. I would say if you 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 want to rely on chemistries to remove the algae, we don't have a good one just yet. They help a little bit, but they're not very good. Um, and the the other thing I want to add about algae is that we used to do experiments where we saw where we evaluated different materials to see how algae accumulated, but we did it not on walking surfaces, but on irrigation materials. And one of the things that we learned with both algae and biofilm is that, for example, if you're using, especially in a propagation house, if you have PVC, PVC builds up more algae and biofilm than, for example, polyethylene pipes. But um, when I say more, it's just that it grows faster in that we were able to measure it, but ultimately both of them will clog. So some surfaces seem to be different at accumulating algae. So if you're, for example, choosing materials for your benches, you can try to select materials that are not as porous as, for example, wood, which I don't see new greenhouses putting wood, but older ones do have some wood still. We have another question uh, here is, what do you think about disinfectation by thermonebulization? Um, is is that like a Foger, Jorge? I, I think that's what he means, right? I'm not familiar yeah, with that. Like in like cut flowers, they use is like a Foger. Uh, it sometimes has like chlorine, and it, they are just like tiny part particles. Mm -hmm, or yes. he says yes, like a yeah. Foger. So we. With the Fogers, I I didn't know this and I learned this, I think three weeks ago from, from Marjorie Daughtry. She was talking about how Fogers are very good for insects 
because the idea with insects is that you want to reach into areas where it's very hard and then you use the poker and basically it reaches like the hidden spots where insects would hide. Um, when you think about plant diseases, when you apply the foker, it's not as good from what she was mentioning. And the main reason is that if you're trying to kill pathogens, you want to have that product to sit and have like good coverage, whether it's a surface or whether it's a, a hard surface or whether it's like a leaf, you want good coverage. And in that sense, she was saying it's better to use conventional sprayers. I would say it's the same thing for surfaces, and I'm guessing here. Um, but the but but the concept that you have to have a prolonged contact time and good coverage to kill pathogens from surfaces is true, regardless of the application method. So I would say Fogger is very good for pat for insects. For disease, it sounds like it's not the best option, and I would think it's the same for surfaces. Like I'm guessing again, but I think that's what Marjorie said and, and it makes sense to me as well. Perfect. We have a couple more questions here in the chat. The first one is from Esther and she said, by the way, great presentation. Uh, she is asking if you could give some suggestions on how to start culture and sanitation in places where they don't have good sanitation. Yes, that's a very good question. And I think it's very hard to start. Whenever you're training a team, you can't train them on 10 things at once. And you really need to start by choosing what is your um, Achilles heel. So where do you think you're, you, you could start and choose that? And when I talked about mapping the greenhouse, there's also this concept where you're also identifying practices what, of what are the areas of risk. So say, oh, okay, we see that, I don't know, that our biggest issue is that we carry too much debris from our outdoor production to indoor production, if that's the case. So it's, I would say you you would have to start identifying what are the, the issues within your, your production system. Um, so it can't be generalized, unfortunately. Awesome, and I think we have time for just the last question, which is, does strip it also take care of anything living on floors and under benches, such as fungus, gnat, larvae? Um, I don't know. I, I, I mean, strip it does work on, on many of pathogens when it's applied to like concrete floors, but I'm not sure what, what's its efficacy with fungus, gnat, so I really don't know about that. Sean, sorry. All right. And um, I would like to thank you again, Rosa. Wonderful presentation. And I would like to thank everybody that joined today for another session of AFE Grow Pro webinar series. Uh, I invite you all to join us on August 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time in our next session on controlling white fly on Poinsettia. Uh, you can visit endowment.org slash growpro to see the full list of upcoming sessions, uh, past webinar recordings, other grower-related resources, and research reports can also be found, all of which are available to you for free thanks to the industry support. We also ask that you please complete the brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.